On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we read and break down your letters to the abusers. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and on this episode, we are bringing back our Letters to the Narcissist, Letters to the Abusers episode, and we are going to read and break down Letters to the Abusers, and we're going to have a couple of poems as well by a couple of poets, and we will be discussing all of these very, very soon. But if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. And there you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button, and please do send it in the format that we ask for. And today we're going to be just reading these letters, and we're going to also have a couple of recordings from the actual poets themselves who have these poems about abuse. And I'll just break into the first letter right now. You can believe I'm stupid, lazy, a loser, an asshole, and an idiot. I know that I'm not. How you can even use those words with me blows my mind. You say I'm caretaking, not parenting. But then when I spend time parenting instead of caretaking, I get told I'm not doing enough caretaking. Then when I try to compensate by doing more caretaking, I'm not parenting anymore. I will never win. And you know me. I'm a hopeful person. And I'm still hopeful. And that makes it so much sadder because my brain tells me to accept it, but it will never change. I logically understand that, but I'm so far into your spell that I hold on so tight to the good times and say to myself, he can't really believe some of those horrible things about me. He loves me, right? Or at least he used to, right? So if he used to, then he can again. If I'm just perfect enough, that's the hope. Just keep trying harder to do everything I can think of doing and just do it the right way. Be as perfect as possible, and then I'll just fail anyway, because there is no real goal. I am just your emotional punching bag. You'll find something new each time that I'll inevitably get in trouble for. Ten years of me learning new things, and I'm doing my best with what I knew at the time. Just like anything else... Just like everybody else. You say I don't work. Then I don't know what to call what I do. I'm certainly completing tasks every day. You think you really know what it's like to be home for 10 years trying to take care of everyone and everything and being told, nope. Still not good enough. No matter how many more kids or rules you add on as we go along, still not good enough. I feed them, bathe them talk to them, play with them, comfort them, get them in bed, do the laundry clean, cook, do all the shopping, all kids' appointments, scheduling, most of their sports, anything school-related, and apparently I also do tablets and dinner cleanup now. I do final cleanup of the night every night. Do I wish I could get more done? Yes. Do I have to pick and choose? Also yes. I'm not complaining about what I have to do. I just don't want you to complain about what I do. I want you to view me as your equal, as I am. I want you to recognize the work that I put in here. I try to have a conversation with you and get one word answers. Never, how was your day? What happened? Or a spark of interest whatsoever. Like I'm actually sitting here while typing this, thinking of how I can be better so that I can prove to you that my only goal is for you to be happy with me. How fucked is that? I happily watch anything you want on TV at night. You want a snack? I got it. I try to put the lid on your coffee as fast as I can after it brews so it stays as hot as possible. Did you know that? 
I try so hard to not get wrinkles in your shirts and sweaters. I think of you when I'm planning dinners that I know you'll like, and then all of a sudden you don't like them anymore. It's the one thing I really feel confident in, and you took it from me. I don't get an unprompted hug, kiss, I love you, let's go to bed, a grab or a squeeze, you name it, I get none of it. And this isn't about you working. You know that I'm thankful for what you do for our family, and the kids know it too. I get absolutely nothing emotionally from you except more abuse. I have no joy because you have killed my joy. I am so worried about doing something wrong to piss you off, and then I'm blindsided by something I wasn't even thinking about. You call that stupid? I call that you, and I aren't the same person, and you want me to fail. I am miserable because I feel so unloved by you after so many years, and you make sure to remind me of it, and I allow it to affect me so much, and now I have to stop allowing it. I love you. I love you even though you hurt me. Every day I would think about you, pray for your safety, cook and clean when you were stressed, upset, and angry. I always put you first, even on days you'd lash out at me for no reason over silly things. But now everything is over. Our lives are separate. And I'm dealing with the pain. I'm still hoping to wake up and be told this was just a huge nightmare. I hate that I love you after everything you've done to me. I feel alone and broken and I'm lost. To trust someone again scares me. To know someone I deeply love just turned on me is crazy. I hate that I still love you. Whew. So, everyone, this this letter right here, I mean, so many people that we have on our show go through this where they are being put down in every single way, not respected at home. And that that they're dealing with someone who has moving goalposts, that nothing will ever be good enough. And the struggle in that and the struggle in trying to make this person happy, except the one thing is they'll never be happy. They're always going to find something that is wrong with this type of abu- of this type of abuser. And I feel so much empathy for this person who's gone through this, who's gone through this type of abuse, this emotional abuse. I feel terrible for the kids as well. And, you know, when it comes to abuse like this, where you're constantly striving and striving and striving, you're giving every single ounce of who you are, and to then come to the realization that it will never be that. And then before... You know, you can do anything about it or say your piece about it. Maybe you are saying your piece about it and the person leaves and and just disappears like none of you ever existed is just extremely hurtful. And that doesn't, those words don't do it justice. And you're left feeling empty and, and alone. You've given so much to someone in every single way and then they're just gone. Like you didn't exist and like nothing ever mattered. You're left there holding everything and you've done all of the work and it's tiring and exhausting and it's sad and it's angering. And the fact that you might still love this person, as this person states, is even more heartbreaking. And a bit of a reminder for those going through this or have gone through this you are good enough, uh, you know, you, you matter, and you are lovable, you are worth it, and you are with an abuser who only thinks of themselves, and you deserve better, you deserve to be appreciated for who you are, and my heart goes out to all of you right now. 
And up next, we have a poem, and the title of this poem is called In the First House. It's by Kate Rogers from her collection, The Meaning of Leaving, and we'll put all of the information for this uh, collection of poems at the uh, in our show notes. And here is the poem, and then we'll discuss it after. Hello, I'm Kate Rogers. And I'm going to read a poem from my forthcoming poetry collection, The Meaning of Leaving, in the first house. I remember my room at the end of the corridor, guard room, top of the stairs. Late at night, fathers tread heavy. Each oak step groaned. I lay in the dark, Yanking hairs from my scalp, rim of the crater, deer fly bite, digging deeper. Every evening, I waited in the doorway of Father's study as he wrote at his desk, becoming a window he could look through. I tried to match his long strides. He said, You walk too fast for a girl. Later in my room, I dismantled my chatty Kathy doll to see how she moved. I buried her head, pink plastic legs under the blue spruce, leaned my cheek against its rough bark. I was father's stupid girl when my sister fell down the stairs. Why wasn't I watching her? Mother napping, father studying, door closed. I played alone, dropped spoons down the coal chute in the basement, listened for echoes. Next day, busy focusing her new lens, mother posed me in the backyard. She missed the swallow-stooped flight over the cedar hedge, wings sharp as shears. I shut my eyes as the camera clicked, practicing absence. I hope you enjoyed that poem by Kate Rogers in the first house. And, you know, my interpretation, and I know everyone will have different interpretations, but my interpretation of what was going on here was this child in this home who was not allowed to be themselves, who was, you know, always kind of told to be a specific way in the pose and that they weren't able to have their own autonomy in that way. And there was a lot of neglect going on within this household as well. And they're not there to be seen as themselves and growing up in a house where you're not allowed to be yourself and that you have to, at the end there, have a pose, you know, the, the, your mom is putting you into a pose. So, you know, and and then at the end practicing absence and you're already kind of living in a home where you're practicing to, or you're being told to be something else that's not you. And you're already practicing absence in that way because you're being told what to do. And, you know, just shutting your eyes helps maybe soothe the absence that is actually going on at the time. So big thank you to uh, Kate Rogers for sending this in uh, in the first house. And up next, we have another letter. I can no longer be with you and allow you to continue treating me the way you do. I will no longer accept all the lies you've told, all the cheating you've done, all the blame shifting in making everything my fault in your attempt to avoid any accountability for your actions. I will no longer tolerate the manipulation and the gaslighting because you inherently fear having to face the guilt and shame of the ways in which you know you deliberately hurt me. 
I will no longer stand for the blatant and dehumanizing disrespect. This is not love. This was never you loving me. This right here, right now, is me choosing to love myself. And when I think about this and I think about all of the survivor stories that we've had and specifically this last line here of me choosing to love myself, many people who are going through these relationships who are in this, you're losing a piece of yourself along the way. You know, every time you, and maybe a rage happens, Maybe you become a people pleaser, you agree to something, and you're fawning, things along those lines. A lot of the time, when that happens, you're, you're, you're losing a piece of yourself along the way. Every step of the way, there's less of you than there was before. And the person at the beginning of the relationship becomes someone completely different by the end. And so many people don't recognize who they are anymore because you're living in this fear you're living in this gaslighting you're living in a fog of fear obligation and guilt and when the other person has become this truth teller in your world truth teller in your world it's really hard to discern what's happening at, at these points and you could be isolated as well and you know you don't realize while this is going on because you're trying to, you know, placate the other person. You're trying to make the other person feel better. You're trying to, you know, just make thing okay. So there's peace. There's, so there's quiet. So there's no rage going on. So there's no put downs going on. And you forget that you exist. You put your hands, you, you put your worth into their hands. You put everything into their hands and you've forgotten that you exist, that you have the right to exist. So for everyone who's listening to this right now, you have the right to take up space. You have the right to exist. You have the right to do whatever it is you want to do. You have the right to be happy. You have the right to have your own autonomy. You have all of these rights. We have an episode about all of your rights. We have, I think it's the 25 basic rights episode that we have. You know, so it's really important to remember that you exist because you do exist. You are a person who is loving, lovable, and you deserve to be loved. You deserve to be treated with respect. You deserve to not be dehumanized. And, you know, just like this person who's choosing to love themselves, I'm not saying choose to love yourself. Well, I am saying choose to love yourself, but I just want you to remember that you are a person and you have the right to exist in every way that you want to. In in doing so and just remembering that you are a person, you know, hopefully that can jar something in you to realize that, you know, it's not just about this other person because that's what they want that you exist too and you deserve the best in your life and that's what I want for you and just like this person said in their letter you know choose yourself choose to love yourself and I'm happy you're here and listening to this and hopefully you do so after this episode so here is our next letter I asked the universe to help me turn the page and move forward with my life. I kept reading, seeking resources to heal, listening to podcasts until finally I managed to make some sense of what I was going through. I recalled all of the moments when you hurt me in a hidden way, the times you devalued my opinion, interests, or friendships, rarely accepting my proposals for plans, When you criticized, insulted, or controlled me in the form of a joke or innocent teasing. When you doubted me in the name of protecting me. Or when you minimized me because I didn't connect with your interests. And when you ignored me while I spoke or ignored my desires and needs. Now I can recognize how difficult it was for me to go through those moments, especially thinking it was my fault. 
I lived a lot of pain and I didn't understand what was happening. I felt that I wasn't interesting enough, that my friends and plans were boring, that my interests were stupid, too complicated or not worthy, that my desires were too much to ask, that I had to change, be better, and that it was all my fault. Finally, I see why it was so broken and attached. I see how those experiences of devaluation weakened my sense of self and drained my self-esteem. And at the end, I found myself chewed up, empty inside with the task of rebuilding myself from scratch. I believe, like me, you have been wounded by life and family experiences. And sometimes those wounds surface and hurt others. Sometimes we are unaware of the impact we have and that makes us tend to repeat behavior patterns. If I had a negative impact on someone I cared about, I would want that person to tell me so I can grow. I don't know if you've realized how much you hurt me. It's important for me to acknowledge that pain and let you see it. I am done feeling alone, done having my needs ignored and dismissed, tired and done of being invisible. My basic needs make you angry. And I couldn't be anything but fine because it would cause an issue. I could never bring anything up. Nothing was ever discussed. Even asking a question was seen as defiant. Defiant. I am not a kid. Your capacity limited who I was. I am done trying to pacify a petulant adult. I feel gross with myself for staying as long as I have. Twelve years. Twelve. The shame kept me fear. But honestly, it was scarier to stay and face your constant instability, unpredictability. I never knew how my day would go. The knots in my stomach never ceased. Insomnia pursued. I am done living like this. Done. So I found this letter on Reddit, and I want to thank the person who wrote this one. I like how this person is acknowledging and sees that this person comes from abuse. And we hear that a lot on the show, that the person that we're talking about has come from abuse and there's empathy for that person. You know, there's trauma that has gone with the per- this person and we understand the mechanizations of why they might be acting out in, in, in the way they are. And a lot of times in these relationships, because of that, people are able to excuse a lot of behaviors and you know they start caretaking who they're dealing with and they can rationalize what's going on and they can minimize their own experiences for a very long time because the other person that you were with the abuser in this situation has come from abuse themselves and you're a good person you have empathy for that and a big thing with this person is that they want to grow. You know, they want to be a better person. They want to learn from their own mistakes if they do something that is wrong. They want to be called out on it so they can work on it. Whereas the abuser in this situation doesn't, you know, they're going to be repeating their behaviors as is said in this letter. They don't want to acknowledge what they have done and that they the whole entire time are just being abusive and you know they've made this person feel less than they've minimized them in every single way and you know sometimes they've used jokes and they've made them feel like their friends aren't every any good and you know there's a little bit of isolation you can tell that has gone on in in this relationship as well and at a certain point of going through all of this and trying as hard as you can as we stated before in a, with a previous letter is eventually you get to a point where you're done and the things that keep you in a relationship in this one, it was shame and it was fear. With this relationship, this person woke up every day not knowing what to expect. And when you're living in 
abuse for so long, you're just trying to survive every single day. All of you people who are listening right now, you're survivors. And when you're just trying to survive every single day, the instability, the unpredictability, you're just trying to maneuver yourself to stay as as safe as possible throughout the day. No matter how bad you might be feeling, you know, from insomnia, as this person said, to their stomach never ceasing from being in knots. You know, your body's at war with yourself trying to tell you something is wrong. But when you're in it, it's so hard to see exactly what is happening until one day, you know, it's scarier to stay. And that has now outweighed everything. And you're just done. You're tired. You're exhausted. And there are so many people right now who are in these relationships that are, you know, going through this every single day, just trying to get through the day. And in a previous letter, we mentioned how, you know, to think about yourself, that you exist, that you're a person. And here's just another reminder here for you that even though you're trying to just survive throughout the day, that you are a person and that, you know, it might be scary to leave but eventually it's going to be scarier to stay and it's all up to when, you know, it takes average one in, on the average, it takes seven times to leave and there's no shame in staying, but you deserve peace. You deserve to live your life. And, you know, just like this one person here, eventually they, they're done and that will hopefully happen with you that you'll survive all of this because you deserve a better life and you deserve better than being with someone who is uh, abusive, who doesn't meet your needs, who doesn't care about your needs. And, you know, if you don't meet theirs, they're going to make you pay. And just a big thank you for the person that wrote this letter. And now we're going to be moving on to another poem. This poem is by Patrick Grace and is called A Violence. And I'll leave all of Patrick Grace's information in the show notes of this episode. And here is his poem, A Violence. A Violence. In the dream, he'd forgotten the winded violence, the night, the first change, the crumbling ceiling. All I saw was up. I forgave him for forgetting the heady violence, the roll, clumsy dance. Around me still I go and look what I find, the cliche or the truth, the water or the truth, the bell clap or the dog bark, the hard fist or the harder word. Can you describe a violence? Works a hotel desk, does he? Wears a smile for strangers, does he? Winds up drunk weekdays, does he? All around me still I hear, all it takes, a moment of courage. Can you hold courage, wield courage, drink up courage, bite down courage, or is courage another one of those things you say? When was the first violence man to man? Did violence start slow? Did violence build up? Did violence lean down or do the bending? Who admitted it first? Was photography invented? Was DNA a thing? Fingerprinting, swabbing, Ulanuth testing? Did they believe you? Did the man in blue believe another man committed the violence? Because it's always a man you have to talk to on the other end. You have to convince on the other end who finds it inconclusive, domestic, misunderstanding. I still find glass in the bedroom, the yelling light, the breath over and over. So with this poem, you know, listening to this, I listened to this one a bunch of times to fully understand, you know, what was going on when it comes to physical abuse and domestic violence 
and course of control. You know, you're going through this and it is scary. And with this poem, it really is the discussion of, you know, eventually, you know, saying something about it, going to the police about what has happened to you and then being asked all of these questions, being poked and prodded in, in, in a lot of cases and dealing with people, more, most likely men, who might not be hearing you, won't be listening to you and, you know, having to go through this scary process to begin with, you know, you're already dealing with this physical abuse and now you have to, you know, muster up all of this courage to go do something about it. And that in itself is scary. And then dealing with these people who a lot of the times aren't going to, not just if they're not going to listen to you, but the burden of proof that you must show to, you know, convince them that what happened to you was real and what happened to you was real. And, you know, the end of this poem, still finding glass in, in the bedroom, the yelling light and feeling like the breath over and over, you know, those scars are there. The glass there still remains. You know, the feelings that you've gone through are still around being abused. You know, all of those things are, are remaining with you, even though others might not be listening to what happened or believe what has happened. You know what has happened to you. And I really want to thank um, Robert Grace for sending in this uh, poem. And, you know, a lot of people out there are scared to go to an authority, not be heard, making things worse, you know, re-traumatizing in so many ways and a big hug to everyone who is going through this struggle right now. You didn't deserve to be abused. No one deserves to be abused. And, you know, there's so much pain that you're feeling trying to, you know, muster up to understand what to do about it, whether it be leaving or report it. And my, just a, my, my heart goes out to everyone who's dealing with this, you know, right now or has de dealt with this and is still feeling all of the effects of what comes along with abuse, the shame, you know, the guilt and, and the fear um, and just all of the emotional wounds as well as the physical wounds that have gone on uh, with everything. And my heart goes, goes out to everyone who's been dealing with this. And that is it for our Letters to the Abusers, Letters to the Narcissist episode. And I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode. Um, and if you want to send in your letters, uh, please do so. And we will eventually create another Letters to the Abuser, Letters to the Narcissist episode. And if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. And there you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And we have a support group at our website. So if you are someone... If, so if you are someone that needs support, uh, go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Support Group. Click on that button and you'll see that we have our very own safe social network. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. It is a wonderful group of people on there. So if you need support, join our support group today. 
And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're dealing with. They have, every, they have every phone number, email address, and web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you're in. DomesticShelters.org has it there. It is a wonderful free resource and organization, so if you need a extra help, extra support, go to domesticshelters.org. And we have another friend of the show called Shelter Movers, and you can find them at sheltermovers.com. And Shelter Movers helps people who are going through coercive control and domestic violence get all of their things out of their home and into storage, and they can get all of your stuff into storage from pets and livestock to to all of your belongings. Uh, Sheltermovers.com can help you in every way when you are trying to get all of your stuff into storage. So if you need help from them or you want to donate to them because they are a charitable organization, uh, you can go to Sheltermovers.com. And that is it for today's episode. So from myself, I hope you have a good night.